Welcome, everyone, to another exciting episode of the YouTube show and podcast, None of Our Businesses. With me today is Tammy Hess. Hello. And I'm Ty Carr. And we are a couple of accountants talking about the news in business, finance, taxes, or other unrelated things. You never know what comes up here, but here's what's coming up here today. Levi's sticking with and growing their brick and mortar presence. And brace yourselves, lease accounting standards coming up and having to be implemented for your small private business. Netflix is getting sued by a Korean ISP. And finally, the Journal of Accountancy survey on client accounting service practices show that they are experiencing a 20% growth within public accounting firms. What do we think about that? All right, well, I'm gonna kick it over to Tammy to get us started. All right, so I have an article. Um, I found an interesting one this week about Levi's and its plans to open 100 stores. The article begins with the growth of e-commerce. So in 2008, the uh, e-commerce made up 3.6 of total retail sales in the U.S. In 2010, businesses such as Amazon and Walmart saw tremendous growth. And we also started seeing other retailers enter into the e-commerce uh, atmosphere. In 2020, online sales were 14% of the total retail sa sales. And during the pandemic, e-commerce sales increased to about 15.3% of retail sales. By 2025, e-commerce sales are predicted to be at 23.5% of total sales. So those are kind of interesting tidbits about the background. And with that trend, one would think that retailers would be moving away from the traditional brick and mortar stores and expand its digital platform. Levi, Stra Levi Strauss uh, and company believe, however, that customers want both. They want to interact with stores as well as shopping online. Therefore, they've been investing in both. <laughs> Last year, Levi's integrated its app to provide curbside pickup and contact less uh, returns. And Levi opened uh, 100 stores last year and plans on opening more than 100 stores this year. What really caught me by surprise in reading this article was the growth of e-commerce. Well, you know, first, I think my expectations would be the growth for 2020 would have been much larger, especially since people weren't, you know, encouraged to go out and about. And so a lot of people were ordering more online. And then I also found that Levi's strategy of increasing stores pretty interesting. You know, does it make sense in investing in both online shopping as well as investing in the traditional brick and mortar? You know, or should companies kind of consider focusing their efforts on online shopping, especially if it's going to continue to grow? So I thought I'd throw that out there first. Uh, what do you think, Ty? Yeah, I mean, I do think it makes sense. Um, I think that is that is the future for large brands like Levi's um, to kind of have their have the have a combination of brick and mortar presence with the online stores because I think that there is I think there's always a group of people a subset of people perhaps the largest group of people that always still likes or appreciates a tactile kind of physical experience um, and I think that even if uh, our habits as consumers are to order more and more online, just the ability to go to a store at some point in your life and uh, try on the Levi's or see the displays or experience that in person. It's an experience. I think that the, I think the brick and mortar store is different, is it, it has a different meaning to it than it did 20 years ago in the sense that, you know, 20 years ago, the brick and mortar store would have been the primary place you know, maybe not even 20 years ago, 10 years ago, would have been the primary place for you to buy the goods, right? And I think now the brick and mortar store is not the primary location for consumers to literally make their purchases, although they might, but I think that the brick and mortar store is an experience for consumers. And that's why I think it will always be part of the strategy or it'll continue to be part of the strategy, I should say, for large brands. Because, and I make that distinction because I think that I think the common intuition is that uh, things going digital and people buying things more online are good for small brands because it allows more of them to get into the market. I think it does, but it also, this issue creates a competitive advantage for large brands who can actually afford to do both. Um, you know, and it's, so it's like, if you, if you're just kind of a, a local uh, designer who makes your own kind of pair of jeans, how do you ever, you know, it just, I think it creates just that much bigger entry barrier to, to ever scale to the level of a, 
of a Levi's if you if if you can only afford to distribute online and digitally, whereas and you can't afford to have these physical experiences because creating these physical in store experiences is very expensive in today's world comparatively. And so, like if I were at if I were at the helm of a brand like Levi's. I would totally do this and I would be doing it in locations where tourists are, you know, I'd have the the store in New York and in, in Los Angeles and uh, Chicago and Las Vegas and in Hawaii and, you know, places where, because that's the thing, you know, people travel, they go and when they're traveling, they like to walk down the boulevard and maybe go into shops. And so I think it totally makes sense to have stores as experiences. It doesn't make sense to have them as distribution centers or or primary distribution outlets but i think we're well past that for most of these companies i think your point too in terms of what a company can afford makes complete sense because that is the the tricky part it's expensive for either or to to really enhance and build a network or your platform um, is really expensive and you know takes and trying to do the a really good user experience online takes a lot of investment and time and atmosphere or you know in, in trying to do that I think on the flip side, you know, having a local spot anywhere is also really expensive, especially when you're talking about hundreds of stores, the brick and mortar can be pretty costly as well. Um, The article also kind of compared to other retailers that are doing things a little bit different and focusing more on just the online. Like what I thought was interesting, they provided the example of Estee Lauder, which for those who don't know, don't know, it's a makeup company, um, which is really hard. Like a lot of people love to try on makeup to figure out um, if if it's the right color for them, if it's going to be the right look. Um, But what they ended up doing was investing a lot of resources in building a virtual type of trying on makeup so you could do it on your computer. And then also having their um, beauty advice advisors uh, online as well so that you have access to them so you didn't have to go to the store. I think, you know, to your point, a larger established organization can probably still do a little bit of both or or a lot of both, especially if they have the funds to do so. And um, they can probably, they have the, the demand to, to be able to, to provide that. But I do think it's one of those interesting things as, as smaller companies or new companies coming on board, it's how do they best to try to do that? Do they go straight to online or do they try a local area or try to diversify and do both? But ha- not having the funds is going to be a little bit problematic on that. But seeing how the trend goes, you know, it, it does seem like that online shopping is becoming more and more of a, of a demand. But I do think that, you know, whether or not you know, uh, when the pandemic's over, people may decide to go back into that on store, you know, in store experience versus doing it online. I do like the idea. And I think that that is wise for Levi to do the situation where you can order using an app or order online, but basically have the features of a um, returning it to the store really easy, you know, and doing things of that nature. Because I think a lot of folks who are doing purchases on, online, especially in terms of clothes, for uh, for example, that they're having, it's so much easier to have order a whole bunch of stuff, try it on, and then return the stuff that you don't want anymore versus having to go to a store, try it on there, and then be, you know, irritated because... <laughs> things don't fit or, and you're wearing a mask and it doesn't, you know, you don't feel like pretty, pretty good about it. But yeah, I, I did think it was interesting because you don't hear very many uh, companies right now expanding their storefront location. So I was quite surprised to see that Levi's doing it and doing uh, both uh, in terms of investing. All right. You have our next article, unless you have anything more to add on that one. Yeah. I was just, I mean, just brainstorming. It seems like if Uh, what a smaller brands might be able to do is rather than invest in the full on customer experience of a full on customer store is perhaps, you know, there could be such thing as customer service centers, right. Where, you know, where they can have kind of a a smaller footprint at a lower cost. That's doesn't have the full capabilities of a store, but it allows customers to pick up and return and get questions answered and stuff like that. So just a thought for entrepreneurs out there that may be thinking through those issues. Yeah. So my article, I'm going to, I'm going to take us into, into the bowels of uh, what we call gap accounting, generally accepted accounting principles, Uh, accounting standards um, as it can relate to small businesses to talk about something that's been in the zeitgeist of accountants for a few years now, and that is lease accounting, because the lease accounting standards uh, were changed and public companies have had to adopt these new standards. And the reason this is a topic uh, for me to bring up today is that um, the, uh, the, these new standards become effective for uh, private companies that are 
uh, purporting to follow GAAP, um, they will have to use them for financial statements that end after, let me make sure I get the date right here. This will be effective for private companies uh, starting with their fiscal years uh, that begin or that start after December 15th, 2021. So the way I read that is, I mean, effectively, that's going to affect calendar year companies on their 2022 financial statements. Um, and and so um, I, I bring this up mainly because it's kind of a, 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 a lights a fire under me to some extent, because I haven't really dug into the technical material in terms of how does this get, you know, what would some of our uh, my uh, clients need to do about this. What would some, what would small businesses need to do about this? Um, some of the things that, uh, that come to my mind on this, you know, it's when we say it's required, like no one's required to follow gap unless they meet some kind of regulatory requirement or, uh, they are a public company or, uh, they have, uh, they decide they're going to get an audit that, says that their financial statements are in accordance with GAAP. So, so you always have that out, right? To the extent that a lot of small businesses that I work with are not technically required to follow GAAP. But one of the, one of the common scenarios that I run into is that the small business may not produce a full GAAP financial statement every year. Um, they may not have an actual financial statement audit that says they follow GAAP but they have bank reporting where they have to send financials into a bank and somewhere in the contract with the bank, it says that, you know, you're following gap. Right. So, so I think there are probably a lot of private companies out there that maybe need to consider this, that may not have even thought about it, that because they don't, they don't have that normal, that they don't have that kind of gap compliance requirement that they think of off the top of their head, but they are sending financial statements to someone and saying that they more or less follow GAAP. They may have investors who have asked them to follow GAAP and they may send kind of internally prepared financial statements every quarter at the end of the year. And, you know, and they intend them to be following GAAP. Nobody's auditing or anything. And so that may be another fact pattern, another case where uh, they may be lost uh, they may be in the cracks here, you know, lost in the cracks in terms of nobody's literally telling them, hey, you need to change your lease accounting or you need to look at that if you're going to tell if you really want to be following gap. So I think there are a lot of um, those scenarios that probably would affect would be coming up in my world where there's a lot of small private companies that, you know, nobody's literally going to slap their hands for not doing this, but but they they think they're following gap. They tell other people who may look at their financials, they're following gap. And if they want to still follow gap, they would have to do this. They would have to implement these new lease accounting standards. And like I said, I haven't gotten into the technical details on this, but you know, more or less the, the, why this is, would be different than any, anything they've done before is that these new standards were designed to require companies to capitalize more leases or to basically recognize the uh, outstanding lease obligations on more commitments and leases than they may have under prior um, under un, under prior accounting methods and standards. So so that's what's at stake is they need to evaluate whether they need if they're going to be if they want to follow GAAP they're going to need to evaluate whether uh, they need to record more obligations on their balance sheets and change fundamentally the way that they're uh, dealing with their rent lease also known as rent expense on their income statement. So, so that's, that's what would be at stake with that. And then I also think that this, well, why don't I just park my thoughts there and turn it over to Tammy and see, see what she has. And, and I can add on to it if I need to, or I want to, I never need to. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have a little bit of experience with this as I kind of think through, cause um, I've, we brought basically what this is the standard is doing is saying, Hey, you need to, to what Ty said, you need to bring your, your leases onto your balance sheet essentially. And then that impacts how you recognize the expenses accordingly. Whereas before, for those who were maybe under audit, um, they would have that all documented in the footnote disclosures. And so things were shown and now they're saying, no, it's not a footnote disclosure. It's embedded in your financials, which there's some, you know, unintended consequences to that because depending on if you have bank covenants, for example, it may, 
cause your bank covenants to go out of whack because of some of the calculations now that are that are changing. Now, what I would say to that is most banks um, know that if that all of a sudden changed overnight, your your financial position didn't change overnight. It's just the fact that now it's on the the balance sheet and it's reported differently in the P and L, and so they should take that into consideration. But one of the things that I would say is what I liked about this article was it provided lessons learned for companies who have already implemented these standards because it's not easy. And that is, um, you know, something to really, really kind of take in into consideration. Um, I would say over 20 years ago when, you know, I was first getting into public accounting, we were talking about these lease standards back then. And it was always like, oh, there's going to be changes coming. And it was delayed forever. So now we fast forward in time and here we are, where we're actually seeing private companies needing to do it. And um, there are some lessons learned from, you know, pu- from public companies so that they can kind of see that. So um, yeah, it is something to really consider. I, I took Ty's point, if you're a small company and you um, I'd like not to do this. I think you just need to have that in your in your knowledge bank, basically, when you're sharing what your financial statements are, that this is excluded or not. And think about, is it worth accounting for and treating it that way? Um, but uh, yeah, it's pretty, it's, time flies. I can't believe it's now here. So now companies do need to take a look at it. But I would encourage all companies, if they have um, operating leases, capital leases, you know, leases in general, to take a look and see if this is something that they should be utilizing and if they aren't sure to ensure that they're working with their accountants um, and folks to to see what this actually means and how to bring it on. Yeah, and I you know the where where I would add more to this in terms of the small private companies is that a lot of small private companies um, and we I often advise this with small private companies if it makes sense for them and they don't have to report to anyone using gap is that they just use a tax basis of accounting. Uh, because if they can if they can get good understanding of their financial position using that basis of accounting, and then that's how their tax return is prepared, that just that just makes the whole accounting system for that really small business efficient, you know, and and decreases the amount of work between kind of your your internal accounting and reporting and your tax your tax uh, preparers, and you know, decreasing the workload in that way translates into lower overall cost and fees for accounting for a small business. So, so normally that's often what I would advise uh, many small businesses. And, um, but I don't know where that goes with these, with, with these lease standards, because in the past, the, you know, the tax, the tax standards were never as well-defined as the uh, gap accounting standards, but the concept in the tax standards, the tax standards use the phrase, a contingent purchase when you had what in gap accounting we would call a capital lease. And the concept of a contingent purchase, the accounting method for tax purposes of a contingent purchase was conceptually in line with the uh, with the standards that were used to capitalize leases for gaps. So from my perspective is that in most cases, you know, you could basically rest assured that you were following a reasonable method of accounting that would be accepted by the IRS if you otherwise were following gap in your books for leases. Well, now if whatever you were if you were doing that and if you just kept doing that going forward, uh, whatever your method was before, um, you you can't really say that you're following gap anymore. <laughs> and so you don't really have like you, you don't have a definitional standard, right? You don't have and and, and the nuance to why that is in the tax world of why that is helpful is that because the tax standard was not as well defined, it mm-hmm. leaves open to the courts this interpretation of, well, are you are you doing something that's reasonable? And when you ask that question, are you doing something that's reasonable, being able to point back and say, well, we're following a standard that is used for financial accounting created by the Financial Accounting Standards Board is a pretty good defense of I'm doing something that is reasonable. But if you are now accounting for leases in a way that it doesn't line up with gap anymore, and and then you later get challenged by the IRS and it's in a gray area and this and the question comes up, are you doing something that's reasonable? You can no longer say, well, I'm doing what was prescribed by the, you know, by gap. You know, you can no longer say that. You no longer have that as your defense, right? So you know, there's a nuance there in the sense that tax law and gap are all were different, and it was never the case that that 
that uh, that you that the tax law never explicitly said follow gap. But but like I said, anytime you are in a situation that says follow follow do reasonable accounting methodologies or follow best practices or anything, any phrasing like that, that leaves over ambiguity in tax law, that's code for you should just follow gap. And, and so, um, or that's that you should translate that. I should say code for that could be confusing to tax analysts out there. You should translate that kind of language to you should follow gap not you i know some colleagues and some tax practitioners out there translate it to oh that means i should do whatever i want because i can argue what's reasonable i would say no the conservative thing to do is to follow the the uh hallmark accounting standards of our industry um so so anyway though that, that's just one one more view on that on this whole thing and uh something Hopefully, I will get into it in more depth and have more updates for you all um, as I get into it and, and as we get closer to having to deal with it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. One question I had, though, as you were talking about um, kind of what your defense could be, could your defense be that it was old gap or, the, you know, up until X amount of date that this was, uh, you know, appeared to be it was reasonable? I don't know if that's a good enough kind of extension of that, but that would be kind of where my mind would go potentially as if, you know, yeah, I, I was following gap and, and we just haven't changed it since the new one just implemented in 20, you know, uh, 21, but I don't know if that's something that you could stand on. I, I think that is reasonable. And I think that's exactly what many businesses will do for a few years to come. Right. But then you'll get to a point, you know, if we're a decade down the road and people are saying, oh, well, I'm following an accounting methodology that was in gap 10 years ago, that therefore I think it's reasonable. That may not fly as, as well. Now, part of what you just said that 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 is, you know, that could could be an also alternative argument that I think does stand up in most cases is, you know, this was their accounting methodology. It if they've been doing this this way for many years because it it was what was gap was they've established a tax method of accounting as well and so so it's 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 reasonable in that context to say well this has always been our tax method we never changed it you know why did it suddenly become unreasonable kind of thing so so yeah i definitely think that way of thinking is is good but um but it it erodes over time it only gets you so far. That, that that does make sense. But I do think that what one thing that folks can kind of think about now is and really think about how many leases you have out there. Think about what what do you have out there that's an op, that was considered you know an operating lease, whether it be uh, for a whole bunch of forklifts or if what kind of look at the get your agreements in order, kind of get those things in place and see how many you actually are looking at. Because in some cases, some small companies may only have a handful of leases or just one. You know, maybe it's just their rental lease, but there are other ones that have you know, uh, like I, I mentioned the forklift, but the copier leases, the, 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 the list goes on and on. Right. So kind of take a look and see in preparation of this and see what you have, what is your exposure? How many out, are, do you have out there that, uh, maybe you weren't thinking of, and, and in addition to your, your already existing capital leases and kind of get those ready and thinking about that. That's, that's great advice. Cause yeah, that is, that is kind of where the devil is in this whole thing, right. Is that there's all kinds of commitments companies have that they may not even think of as being covered under the, the these standards of leases. And, and so really doing a, a detailed inventory of what kind of commitments and obligations and agreements you have um, that, that could be considered this um, is, is a hundred percent kind of going to be necessary to evaluate what you do next. Let's hear what you got next, Tammy. Earlier this month, news came out that SK Broadband, which is a South Korean internet service provider, sued Netflix. Why? Well, SK felt that Netflix should pay for the cost of increased network traffic and maintenance because of the surge of viewers watching and using Netflix. The article states that Netflix series Squid Game was the primary reason for the surge. And I don't know if you're watching this time, but it's a new hit show. I'm not. I uh, I looked it up when I saw saw it in this article, but uh, I have not. I, I think I get the gist of it, but I haven't gotten into it. Well, apparently a lot of people are watching it. Um, and so it's really causing a little bit of traffic on their their networks. And according to this article, there are. There are two large users of networks of the South Korean uh, networks network. Uh, One being Google's YouTube and Netflix in that order. So uh, Google YouTube is number one, and Netflix is number two, and they are not using or not not paying. Sorry, the network user fees. 
There are other companies, however, that are paying for such fees. And some of them, some of them that the article named was Amazon and Apple and Facebook. So in 2020, Netflix actually brought forth a lawsuit to determine whether or not they had any obligation to pay for SK's network usage. The courts, however, sided with SK Broadband and stated that essentially SK is providing a service at a cost and it's reasonable for uh, Netflix to be obligated to pay for something in return for that service. So the estimated fee that we're talking about here is $22.9 million for one year alone. Netflix, as you probably can uh, guess, is currently appealing this ruling. So we'll have to wait to see how this all plays out. Now, when I was reading this article, the thing that kind of stood out to me was, you know, before I go into whether or not if it's reasonable to be paying for the, the network and the traffic data and all that stuff, my biggest question is how did we get to this point where we're essentially talking about $22.9 million that um, SK feels that Netflix is owed, you know, owes them, you know, wouldn't there have been some type of contract in place saying that here, Netflix, if you, you know, you are, we're charging you a, a fee for the use of our service or, and things of that nature. But it seems like we're, you know, two years down the road and, um, now they're going to be asking for the money paid back for 2020. So I don't know what your thoughts are on this tie, but it was interesting to me. Yeah, I mean, I think they're they're redefining who the user of the broad broadband is, right? They're saying, you know, they're saying, well, the supplier of content is the user as opposed to the consumer of the content being the user, because their contract typically uh, for for an internet service provider, their contract is with the consumers, with the users, right? And they potentially could charge those consumers more for the content they, you know, that they get, but they just find it in this case in Korea and in the direction they're going with it, they're they're finding it easier to just go after Netflix for that additional usage rather than going after the actual consumers for that additional usage. I think, um, you know, I think ultimately, yeah, I, I think ultimately, if if that's the case, now we do. There is, there's, that's not unprecedented, kind of in the way we regulate various kinds of things. You know, for example, um, in order to in order to fund states in this country, we have sales taxes, where you know we basically charge consumers, but we charge it through the we charge it through the providers of goods, right? So we we add sales taxes onto goods forcing the purveyor of goods to collect that tax essentially. So we, we levy that. And ultimately, if the, if the provider of those goods doesn't collect that tax, then that provider has to pay it, right? So, I mean, that's the, it strikes me as that's the position that, the, that Korea is putting, uh, is, is putting Netflix in is that, you know, ultimately one way or the other, either Netflix absorbs it or they have to collect it back from their customers by, raising prices, which is kind of an indirect tax on the consumers, right? So, so I, where I think, I personally think the Korean court is erring to some extent, erroring in their ruling or in the way they're addressing this is that they're allowing, you know, this really comes down to who has to, who basically has to face the consumer with additional fees here? Is it Netflix or the ISP? And they're shifting that burden from the ISP to Netflix. And I, I don't know. I don't know that that's naturally more appropriate from my perspective. But um, yeah, those are those are my thoughts. But I guess my yeah. But why wouldn't that have gotten at least asked or addressed prior to this? Where I do understand that the fact that there was an additional cost because of the fact that they had to build the infrastructure for this higher usage of, of traffic and, and being able to maintenance on that and do all those things. But it is harder at this point because let's say now SK charges um, Netflix, Netflix has to pay it. And then Netflix is going to recoup it by, to your point, passing the feeds along to customers. Well, they aren't going to go backwards. They're going to be like going forward. Here's what your new monthly fee is. A lot of customers, you know, could end up stopping, you know, ceasing their agreement with, with Netflix at that point, because it got too expensive, but Netflix is still on the hook on that. Now, granted, apparently the, the squid game is so hot that maybe people won't ever, you know, leave Netflix for it, but you don't know that. I, and to, to be arguing this a year after the fact or two years after the fact, it seems just to be outrageous. And that's, that's point. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it does it does seem unfair and seems unlikely that it would happen in, outside the context of a, you know, a court in Korea ruling against a U.S. company, right? So, you know, it seems like if it, if it wasn't, if it was a domestic com, you know, a domestic company might not face that kind of unfair unfairness. Or similarly, you know, if 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 local ISPs were making this case here in the U.S., uh, which we might see, um, it'd be interesting to see if you know U.S. courts would be more favorable or would think about the fairness against Netflix to, to Netflix on that a little more, right? In the sense uh, of some of that point. Um, yeah, because I mean, I think that's that is the thing is that the the ISP, you know, they may have some other kind of contractual relationships with Netflix that I'm not aware of. But with regard to this particular issue, theoretically or conceptually speaking, that there is no contractual relationship between Netflix and the ISP. That's why they had to get the government involved to force a payment from Netflix, because Netflix is not a customer of the ISP directly in that way. Um, and so, and so, yeah, it does, it does feel roundabout in an unfair way to address the problem. Yeah. The other thing I also did was I tried to do a Google search to see if um, Google was being sued by this as well, because they were the number one user or, or uh, source of the network traffic. And I couldn't find anything. So um, it'll be interesting to see because then it's like, why is, why is it that Netflix is the only one on the hook here in terms of if they're number two and, and Google was, isn't paying in these types of fees right now. So maybe they're going after it for, I have no idea why, but I thought that was interesting to say like, well, if you have your two top provider or users um, or causes, I guess not, they're both not paying, then why wouldn't you be going after both of them and not just the one, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I guess we're going to have to wait and see how that plays out. But I did think that was interesting in terms of, of one, the dollar value amount, but two, just the, the fact of, of where they're headed and, and what the original court uh, ruling was and the fact that it's still an open issue. So we'll have to see where that goes. All right, Ty, you have our last article. All right. Well, uh, this one. Uh, also comes from the Journal of Accountancy. It was a survey that says that past practices uh, are experiencing 20% growth. Um, and you know, when we when we say cast, that is the term used by the uh, AICPA, the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants, as well as commonly used in public accounting firms for client accounting services, um, which is like. I guess a, a fancy way to try to distinguish it from bookkeeping, essentially, um, and and so um, yeah, the, the there were a few things in the uh, the survey was definitely interesting because in our business we we do like I'm not disparaging bookkeeping in the sense that we do some work that could be also considered bookkeeping, and so there's some crossover between kind of work that we do as a CFO and outsourced accounting firm and a public accounting cast practice. And so the growth that they're seeing there is, is of industry interest in particular to, to, to my, our business and, and what we do at, at Tycar Advisory. Um, but, you know, some of the, some of the things that uh, stood out to me or that, that I thought were interesting uh, to discuss, and maybe I'll just take them one at a time and we can pitch it back and forth. Um, uh, one of this was, well, one of this is, the, the first question that I have for us to discuss on this is why exactly is our cast practices growing, you know, and, and we've definitely seen demand for, you know, the, the, the practice in our business that is closest to what a public accounting firm would call a cast practice is what we call outsourced accounting. And we've definitely seen a lot of growth there too. So, so why is this happening, uh, particularly among small businesses? Um, and I'll put forth, forward that in the article, they, they put forward this theory that it's because of the growth of cloud tech. Um, but I'm kind of like, mm, I don't, you know, it, it seems like, it, it, and, and that because of cloud tech, it's now more possible, therefore it's growing, which is very much an accounting accountant's answer. Like, oh, now that I'm capable of doing this easier, that's why the market's responding to me. You know, it's like accounts, we always think like the market out there is responding to what's easier for us. And I don't know if that's really the right the right answer. So yeah, let me throw that back to you, Tammy, and see if you have any thoughts of why why is this happening? 
Yeah. So my thought in terms of that would be the need, the, the value that a company sees in the having proper accounting uh, financials and having a partner at the table to discuss their finances is grown, has grown. In my past history, I, I find that most people were thinking of accountants and accounting as the kind of a book, a scorekeeper, a scorekeeper, someone who's just really processing the transactions, entering the information in. And whereas there's been more of a growth to understanding that the financial accounting team, our financial accountants are there to help with the business strategy, the business growth, and understanding why the business is where it is and where it needs to go. So I, I think, yes, tools in making things um, more accessible has made it easier to do that. But I do think that there's more of a need to that to do that, especially as the world keeps on changing and owners are finding themselves wanting to really understand where they are in terms of their financial records on a more timely basis and having the, those discussions on a more regular basis as business is always changing. Yeah, I mean, I can't disagree with any of that. I mean, that that all sounds that all sounds like it like it is to me. I, I would say I don't know myself. I mean, I, I like that answer, but I I feel like this is a question that I I was hoping to get a better answer from the article on because it is something that I want to understand better, you know, what is actually changing in the thought process of entrepreneurs and operators that's making them consider, I mean, I guess for me to, to, to put this out on the table of, you know, where my question is, is why is it an operator would consider outsourcing that rather than just paying, having somebody in-house do it. Right. Um, and, and, and I, it's not clear to me. I don't, I don't have a clear answer for why that is. And maybe the technology is part of it that because they can, they feel like they can have more real, they're going to, I think COVID certainly, if we look at it over the last year, I think the pandemic certainly has helped accelerate this to some extent, because then perhaps the proposition to uh, an operator is, Hey, I'm going to be working with my accountants remotely, no matter what I'm doing, even if they're an employee because that's the way the world is now. So the idea that they have to be an employee who is in my office is already gone. So maybe now that opens the door to me considering all possible remote options, including contractors and services that aren't my employees per se. Um, you know, yeah, that, that that's kind of where my head is. And it is what, what is, and yeah, what is changing in that thought process for operators? I think maybe there, there is some truth to that. It's like, if you, there's a couple of things. One of the thing that when you were talking that kind of got into my mind a little bit differently was the fact that a lot of times the people who are doing bookkeeping or doing, you know, the financial accounting process of the books are also doing other things at a client. They don't have, they don't have enough work necessary to have a full-time accounting department, let alone accounting person to, um, to facilitate in their, in their accounting and their finance uh, kind of structure. So you, if they were already using someone who maybe wasn't an accountant to begin with, and they were doing something else and they're using them part-time just to get the books and, you know, recorded or, um, and, and to print financial statements, then yeah, now that we things that are a little bit more open and things are on the cloud and, and you can work with someone like that remotely, it makes it a lot easier to do that. And it probably makes more sense to have a professional doing that rather than someone who is doing that on the side of, of their normal day-to-day business. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that makes, that make that makes sense to me. Well, here's another question that I had about this or another thought I had an observation. Let me say that another observation I had about this, I'll get your take on my observation. So, um, you know, they, in the article, they, they made this point, they called it true cast versus just bookkeeping and compliance. And by true cast, they said true doing true cast meant doing, uh, doing outsourced accounting and, uh, advisory. Um, but yeah, I, I guess this kind of discussion always like kind of gets me in some way because it's like, okay, so you change the word from bookkeeping to accounting when you talk about true cast versus the not so true cast. I, that's not very explanatory. And I don't know that that, uh, I don't know that I agree that that actually makes, in fact, I'd say I probably don't agree that that, that there is a difference there. And frankly, you know, I work and talk to a lot of accounting firms, CPA firms, and most cast practices that I know of are what I call the box. They are, they are creating a technology. They're doing what CPA firms are built to do really well. They're creating a standard process. 
standard set of parameters with a standard stack of uh, of software tools like they use QuickBooks and Bill.com and Expensify, whatever the, that that would be three three components of a common stack and whatever small business comes their way, they're going to fit them into that box and they're going to work with them to run their transactions through that. That may be, I think as accountants, and I, I get where the ICPA is coming from as like hardcore accountants and thinking, wow, that's really the, that newfangled thing of having a tech stack versus the way we used to do accounting a decade or more ago. Okay, I get that's new and all that, but conceptually speaking, if you're not an accountant, if you're more in the world of, general consulting or management advising or whatever, doing that, providing the tech stack and creating the box as new or technology oriented as it may be, is not any different than basic bookkeeping or compliance. It's a different way to do it, but it's still bookkeeping and compliance. So this idea that true CAS is different than bookkeeping and compliance, I don't, I don't get that. I don't think I agree with that in general. Um, now, to the extent that some CAS practices are actually doing some advisory, good on them, and that would make them different than standard bookkeeping and compliance. But I would challenge how much of that is actually happening in most CAS practices. The devil's in the details. So as you're kind of saying that, I think that that is 100% true. If you're looking at at you utilizing a CAS uh, firm and seeing what the what they're providing, I think seeing exactly what they're they're trying, what service they're providing is going to be beneficial to figure out whether or not it is more on the bookkeeping side or the scorekeeping side versus is it more on the partnership advisory understanding what the transaction sides are somewhere in the middle, right? And what I think is interesting is I I do think that there are some of it, if you're being put to fit in a box and so then therefore you are getting your accounting needs met in the sense of the transactional work and then you're getting financials at the end of the of the month and it's all kind of shaped out and formulated in this nice template. That's great. I would say that that's providing you information, but that's not providing advice or um, kind of forward thinking or thinking about that way. But it, you know, I think that whoever's utilizing these services need to understand what they're asking for and what they're being engaged to, you know, what they're going to be engaging for. Because if you think you're getting the advisory, but when you sign the the engagement letter or the service contract, and what you're actually are doing is getting fit into this box and then just getting a print a nice pretty financial statements at the end of the month, that's probably not going to meet what your what your expectations are. So know that in advance beforehand and make sure you find the right person that's doing the service that you want. Because I think in some cases, some clients may just want that, where they're like, I do want my transactions handled and I want financial statements. I don't necessarily need the advisory. And in some cases, they want both. Or sometimes they just want the advisory. So it's really understanding what your needs are and then what the whoever you may be using, what service they're actually providing. 100%. I think you said it right on is that is that it's not, yeah, a lot of that just isn't isn't really advisory. And I think that's you know, a different way to get the accounting done, an efficient way to get the accounting done, all of that, that's all great. And there's nothing wrong with that. And and part of our business is outsourced accounting where we help companies with some of that as well. But we don't we don't confuse ourselves and call it advisory when it's not. And I think that's what accountants need to be careful about is that is that it's very difficult, you know, I, I'm going off on a tangent here, but in my experience, it's diff- very difficult for accountants to make the to make the leap from doing accounting to being an advisor, to doing advisory. And so, you know, we think different accounting for different things, we start calling advisory, right? Create, you know, to, and so to your point, creating a nice dashboard that is automated and that you deliver to the client is of good value. And if you can make a business out of that and be profitable, good on you, that's great. But, but just a reporting dashboard is not advisory. <laughs> so that it, it's just a different set of reporting. It's a different kind of bookkeeping. It's a different kind of accounting and that's fine, but it's not, it's not really advise. You're not advising just by presenting somebody with a dashboard. It's what you do next. It's, it's how you get meaning out of that information that becomes advisory. And I would challenge that the vast majority of our, of our colleagues that are CPAs starting to do this kind of thing, aren't doing what's next. They're just, they are just providing the dashboards but I think to, to, to counter that, the owners or the people who are hiring these services to do that are thinking they're getting the advisory. And so 
it's, it's very interesting to kind of see that. And that's where there is some disconnect there, right? Because if you have a service provider thinking that they're doing one thing and doing it really well, but then you have a client, you know, or owner who's thinking I wanted more and it's not aligned correctly. That's not necessarily what they paid for, but that's probably what they what they envision this uh, partnership to be, or this engagement to be. And that, that's not. So being clear in advance on both sides, is going to be really quite beneficial to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, oh, so I have more to say on this. <laughs> <laughs> I have more to say on this. So they taught, you know, another, another peeve of mine is in this constant discussion about uh, this kind of new age services for accountants is this idea of fixed fee billing and how it's like, you know, the end all be all and how, how important it is and all that. And so, um, but I, I thought it, I thought it was actually a little bit interesting that as they talked, they showed the shift in a graph from their survey of, of companies that have gone from billing time and materials to companies that are doing more fixed fee billing. What I do like that they did in the survey is, although I don't know if the respondents knew exactly how to respond appropriately to this, but, but they, but they did make an attempt to differentiate between fixed fee billing and value-based billing. And so one line item in the survey was fixed, uh, fixed not to exceed billing, which is where a lot of the growth was from time and materials. A lot of the growth went up to a lot of these cast practices doing fixed not to exceed. And I think that's a very, I mean, that part in parentheticals not to exceed is a very important distinction because, you know, really they're providing fixed fees that benefit the client in this, you know, it's fixed fee contracting, that kind of billing is not like if if adv if advisors to CPAs out there are saying this is the new way to do billing that's going to make you more profitable of course it's not right like i mean that this is this is the kind of billing that will whipsaw you because if you're doing fixed fee billings not to exceed that's a sales trick that, that that's what you do when you need to make the sale and you need to make the client comfortable that you're not going to exceed some billing. Every, every contractor who's not even in accounting knows this. This is not a, an accounting specific issue. Like if you do construction and you do fixed fee bids not to exceed, you know, you're in the danger zone, right? So this is not like, so, so I think thinking of that as like, that's the Holy grail to get to fixed fees I think that uh, that was an important parenthetical for put to put in there that so many firms are going to fixed fees not to exceed. I don't think they're getting to the promised land with that kind of billing. Now, if more were going to the value-based billing, which that line item did show growth in it. So, so it does look like firms are switching from time materials to value billing. If they're truly doing value billing, then, then I think they might be getting to a better spot profitability for themselves. But I think that's a distinction that a lot of people don't know is the difference between kind of a fixed fee versus a value billing because fixed fee, you, you can still kind of think of it in terms of hours and rates and do fixed fees, right? You just take your old time, uh, time reporting system and you, you say, well, I'm just going to not charge them for more than X number of hours. And so here's your fixed fee. So you're still, the paradigm that you're thinking in is still very much an hourly rate per hour type of basis, you, you've just done it on a fixed fee. You, you've done it in a fixed fee way, right? So going to fixed fee doesn't get you out of thinking of your time, thinking of the value you bring just as the hours that you bring. Value billing is about thinking about what is the, what is the fee for the value I brought to the table, not for the time that I spent, right? And that is a huge leap that a lot of accountants can't make easily. Um, and so I'd say that's, that's where profitability comes in. And by the way, in our own firm, we haven't fully made that leap. And I'm not sure I believe you can make that leap to full value billing for every kind of service you provide. So when we do outsourced accounting, which again is closest to what they call CAS, uh, we don't we don't do fixed fee or try to do value billing there because we we've, we've found it very difficult to do value value billing in that zone. Whereas when we do true advisory, what we call a CFO advisory service, we are able to do value billing in that way and the and do something that is very profitable for us and and is uh, seen as a value and and uh, makes the client feel good about the situation as well. So so yeah, that was. That that was another another 
piece of this article I wanted to comment on. <laughs> Thank you. I, yeah, I know that that's a very uh, uh, passionate conversation or topic for you, for sure. I think what's interesting about that is when I was looking at that is, and you can kind of correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the, the going away from time and materials billing is, it could be the fact that people have defined what that box is. So you can almost sit there and say, I'm not going to bill you now for my time for every hour spent, because now I know that it doesn't matter who you are. If I'm going to be doing X amount of transactions and this size of business, it's going to take me X amount of time to do that and to prepare the cookie cutter financial statement report and dashboards and call it a day. And so they've gotten more, you know, built the efficiencies or understood how much time that does take. And they just apply that to everybody. And so therefore you can have one, one fee, whether you consider it to be value billing or whether you consider it to be fixed that you have this one fee and you know what it is versus as you're trying to determine typically how to, um, to service a, a, a new client or a new um, company when you're doing a CAS work that you don't, you aren't sure. So that's why you don't want to get into that stuck fixed fee or a value bill. Cause you aren't sure what that, what the end game looks like. So I, that would be, that's where my mind went is like, Oh yeah. Like in 2018, when it was still relatively new and they were still growing a lot of it was in time and materials because I think it was the unknown. Now in 2020, where they're saying that, hey, we've seen this all growth and now we have these standards and we have all these things, you're seeing a shift where we, a fixed fee or a value billing can be generated because you do know how you, I guess you assume you know how long it's going to take. But yeah, it is in- interesting. Any, any other hot, hot buttons you want to <laughs> this push for you? No, I mean, I would, I would just, I, w- I would, I would note you know, I, I talked to some things I didn't agree with in the article. So I'll, I'll say one thing that I did agree with in the article was, you know, they, they looked at and said, well, they found that there was a strong correlation between successful cast practices and having a dedicated staff to that kind of practice and providing training to that staff. And I think to me, that's, yeah, of course, you know, so that makes total sense to me. And, and I'm hundred percent on that page. I mean, our firm by its nature, because all we do is CFO advisor and outsourced accounting, our entire team is dedicated to that. You know, there's no possibility that we're trying to split the time with our people and doing say tax returns or audits or other things like that. But, um, but we certainly also believe in the training aspects of it. We put a lot of time and investment into that with our people. So I think that's, um, and I think, so it is heartening to see that other firms who do the same, uh, that there's a correlation there in, uh, to their success and tells me that we will, good reason for us to just continue down that path. All right. Well, on that note, uh, thank you all for joining us for another episode of None of Our Businesses, where we discuss news in business, accounting, and taxes from an accounting's, accountant's perspective. Please hit the like and subscribe buttons if you're watching this on YouTube or rate us on your favorite podcast app. Until next time, have a good day. Bye, everyone. Bye.